Welcome to Science Fiction 101, the podcast series where we explore the science fiction field from all angles, covering the past, the present, the future, up, down, backwards and sideways. We're your hosts. I'm Phil. And I'm Colin. And the good news is, in the table of best UK sci-fi podcasts published by Feedspot, we've moved up from number eight to number six. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad, is it? No. A two yep. point two point rise. If we if that is maintained over the over the next year, we'll be at number one before you know it. I told my wife about that last night and I said, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's theoretically possible that we could be nominated for a Hugo or <laughs> something else. And she got this look in her eyes and she says, Does that mean we get to travel? I'm like, uh, Oh, of course. Definitely. Yeah. At at your own expense, of course. <laughs> Completely at our own expense. Yeah. <laughs> um, it'd be nice to think of, of that, but I, uh, having seen the audience figures of some of the, the biggest podcasts, uh, we're, we've got a long way to go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just keep podcasting and having fun doing it. Yeah, and slowly build that audience. Thank you, listeners. <laughs> uh, we had some comments on the last episode. Um, our friend Emmanuel on Twitter said, very interesting discussion and quiz. Murderbot is indeed a very interesting character and storyline, but I wonder how deep it really is long term. I guess we'll see. So perhaps a little bit of scepticism there from Emmanuel. Emmanuel, by the way, also has a new podcast series, which is all about French history for Americans. Uh, It's called Lafayette, We Are Here. Uh, (laughs) Anyone who's interested in French history, go to lafayettepodcast.com. He didn't ask me to say that, by the way. I'm just offering that as a... As a recommendation. And on Facebook, uh, Joe said, uh, Colin Kusky, I think there is only one novel in the Murderbot series so far. The most recent book, Fugitive Telemetry, is a novella like the first four in the series. And uh, I think you you concurred with that, didn't you, Colin? Joe was definitely right. I misspoke. And for anyone who's wondering what the difference is... uh, the science fiction writers of America, or whatever they call themselves these days, uh, they define a novella as 17,500 words to 40,000 words, and a novel is defined as 40,000 words or above. So th- those are the differences there. Just to put things in perspective, uh, I I happen to know, I don't know the length of many books, I happen to know that Fahrenheit 451 is about 43,000 words, so it barely counts as a novel, but it is a novel, but only just a very thin novel. A very good one. Oh, indeed, indeed. And someone called Colin Kusky on Facebook (laughs) said, Phil Nichols, if I send you an audio snippet, can you edit it in in an homage to Fahrenheit 451's theme of malleable media? And what you were suggesting there is that you send me a snippet of you saying la, and I add that onto, the, <laughs> yes. onto you saying novel, so it becomes novel, la. <sighs> Never got round to that, but... Uh, I, no, because I... <laughs> <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine it working, and there, we had the experiment where I had to read my lines because the recording failed, and I oh did not want to tank a podcast because of my mistakes. <laughs> so uh, th- thanks for the feedback, listeners. And if you have any more comments on what we talk about today, uh, go to the usual places. We're on Facebook. There's a website as well, which is 101sf.blogspot.com, and you can leave a comment on there. Now, on to today's topic. Colin, you suggested that we discuss an article that you'd seen about the idea of canon. Yes, and I have to confess that I am, there's something I just thought of that I should have done um, to prepare for this a little bit better, but it's an article by Dr. Sean Duke, Mm -hmm. and uh, the, 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 the title of the article is Why the Science Fiction Canon Doesn't Exist. Right. And this was written in response to another article that came out, and I believe it was maybe Wired Magazine's top 50 science fiction books of all time. Yeah. yeah. And I'm probably wrong about the amount, and I'm probably wrong about the source, (laughs) but boy, did people get all up in arms because of what was and what wasn't on it. Yeah. And, you know, to Dr. Duke, I think this suggested the question, why isn't there an accepted science fiction canon? And so he, he launched into the subject. Can you, can you summarize the 
the argument that he makes? Whew. Yeah, there are several facets to it, mm-hmm. and uh, they fall into two generic categories. One is that canon tends to be an academic discussion. Right. Yeah. Between academics in a community, we all kind of you know talk and agree. And I use the word we broadly because uh, it's really you. Uh, I, I am not an academic. Ah, I see. Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> I'm just some random guy in America that likes to talk on, on the internet. <laughs> so the, the uh, academics get together and they decide what canon should be. Like, you know, we agree that for English literature that it's Shakespeare yeah. um, and several related works. Uh, science fiction academia is at most, in, in, a, in a broad sense, 10 to 20 years old according to Mr. to Dr. Duke. Yeah. yeah. And so there there aren't enough academics yet to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. And the the second part is is that so in the generic sense of science fiction the canon doesn't matter. People read what they enjoy to read. Uh, in the last 120 years literature of all kinds and, and reading materials are more broadly available on an international basis with no um no financial or or class requirements than it ever has been before mm-hmm. so at at most canon suggests things which were popular and influential but never necessary right yeah or it's some kind of um putting things into well, I mean, canons don't strictly do this, but there, there is a sense that there is some texts that are superior to others and that somebody somebody somewhere is able to identify which ones are the important ones because they're the better ones. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of a gatekeeping thing going on with the idea of canon, that there are some things worthy of study and some things that aren't, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And at, at the fan level, um, sometimes... Uh, canon or the classics are used to gatekeep like just like you said right oh you haven't read asimov therefore your opinions are ill-informed your writing is bad blah 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 yeah Uh, and i had this discussion with my son last night because he asked me what we were going to talk about today and i said that it seemed odd to me that that you know me as a science fiction reader who wants to read about alien cultures and aliens and things that don't exist that i don't spend a lot of time reading international science fiction because yeah those cultures are completely different. Their ideas of science fiction are completely different. Um, that isn't something that I've worked a lot on in the last month since we've talked about it, yeah. but I intend to. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the problems with the idea of canon. It seems to me that the very concept of a canon uh, comes from a, like an earlier age where English, well, speaking as an Englishman, where English literature <laughs> was the literature of English speakers, and we're not at all interested in the literature of other languages, we're, we're not interested in other cultures. Um, I think we now live in a world where people are quite genuinely fascinated and intrigued by other cultures, other literatures, and the idea of a canon, a global canon, it seems to me, is almost impossible. I think you could have one on a kind of a national level. So you could have the the gr- great American novels. You could have the great British novels. Uh, but the idea of having a world canon strikes me as impossible. And I, that's one of the reasons why I think the idea of canon is a bit of a crazy idea. Um, I, I looked a couple of things up. I when I did my PhD, I'm I'm not an English literature major by any means and I my PhD was looking into the screenwriting of one author now in order to do that I had to find a suitable supervisor who happened to be in an English department so technically my PhD is in English but my my subject wasn't English literature at all but in order to be able to get through the the kind of gatekeeping that goes on when you're examined for a PhD um, I had to, to some extent, become familiar with the sort of critical thinking that goes on in the English literature world. So I'm I'm somewhat familiar with some of the concepts. But something I was able to glean is that um, when people talk about canon, what they're usually talking about, when the scholars are talking about canon, they're usually talking about um, considering the characteristics of the texts, uh, the complexity 
um, of the writing, the the unity uh, of a of a novel. Let's say how well everything coheres within the novel, uh, the the quality of the writing, the language used, and that kind of thing, and also the subject matter. And when when you take all of those things together, it's very difficult to avoid becoming snobbish. <laughs> and I, I can't separate those two things. I can't separate the what seems like a lofty aim of wanting to define a canon, but without seeming to be a snob. Which, you know, I, I find that very hard to get around. So I, I don't find that I don't find canon very interesting in that regard. But we all of us love lists, don't we? We all we love, do. A, we love a top ten. We love a top fifty. And I think what many of us love about them is because we can pick holes in them wired comes up with their top 50 and we say oh that's that one shouldn't be at number five this one's been left out and so we we love to pick holes in other people's lists but then we all have our own individual canon and what's the point of a canon canon if yours is your canon is different to my canon it's it's just pointless it's just personal taste in the end so it, it's all a bit weird. The the other thing, um, and again, not wanting to go all English lit on you because I'm I'm not an English lit major, but it seems to me that over the last maybe twenty or thirty years, in the humanities, in the arts, th- there has been this dethroning of the author, and consequently, almost a dethroning of the text, and a lot more has been now turned back on the reader. So when we consider a text, it's not because there is something inherent in the text. It's what can the reader find in the text or what does the reader bring to the text? So it's very Ah. much seen as a dialogue uh, between the the consciousness of the person reading it and the words on the page. And we we don't really go into the, the, the sort of motivations or psychology of the author these days, I don't think. Uh, I think it's, a, it's almost seen as taboo to talk about that kind of thing in an English lit context because we can't know what an author intended. Um, all we've got is the words on the page. So therefore, it's, it's more about what I get out of it when I look at those words and what those words mean to me. And of course, a text can therefore change its meaning over time because it may have been written in one context, but now has a new meaning in our modern day world Fahrenheit 451 is a classic example it was written in the 1950s uh, as a response to television as a response to McCarthyism as a response to the Cold War but if you read it today you see oh the characters are walking around with earbuds in they are um, (laughs) they're self-absorbed by the media that they consume. So reading Fahrenheit 451 today, it seems like it's commenting on our world and it makes makes it look as if Bradbury was really prescient, but he wasn't. He was talking about the world as it was in 1953. So, um, yeah, well, I've gone off on a tangent there. <laughs> well, and it's a, it's a very interesting tangent. Um, and I'd like to dig into it just for a sec before we go back to canon, because... Mm. Uh, it's a discussion that Seth and I have very frequently about death of the author and what's the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, we had this on this little discussion on Facebook yesterday and on a disc golf course in the rain also yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, this idea that, <clears throat> uh, that the story is what the reader perceives versus what the author wrote, I think has a lot to do with the skill of the author. Uh, yeah. Stephen King has the famous quote where he says that uh, authors practice a unique kind of telepathy where they write things down and cause the reader to think things. And so he yeah. he puts down an example paragraph and he goes, now, you know that in that paragraph, the cat is really important. And you know that because of the way that I wrote it, which means that he meant the cat to be significant and that the reader got it. Right. And, yeah. I, and I, I think if you if you consider... What would motivate somebody to create a canon, apart, apart from the personal canon uh, that we, we've just spoken of? If, let's say, a, um, a group of scholars got together and said, we must define the canon of X, Y, or Z, you've got to ask, well, why? Why are you defining that canon? Now, you might be doing it for gatekeeping reasons, because you say, well, we don't want people to study that stuff over there. 
they must only stuff at, uh, study this stuff. So that would be a, a, a bad reason for defining a canon. But there could be positive reasons, such as, well, we want to save scholars time. Uh, we, we don't want them to have to read everything that's ever been written. If we can define the like the 100 core texts and everybody reads those 100 core texts, everybody will have a shared understanding of the world. Now, that, I think, is a worthy thing. I think it, th that's a reasonable thing to do. Oh, definitely. But then, from a scholar's perspective, the, the texts that are going to, going to be worth studying are probably not the texts in that 100, because what's going to be interesting is to take something that's outside of the 100 and then compare it to what's in the 100. So <laughs> the, the, the canon... It exists as a way of saving time. It serves as a tool to indicate which things need further study. But the canon surely must evolve over time. And I noticed on Sean Duke's website, as a follow-up to that article on canon, he uncovered some proposed canon list of science fiction that's... I've forgotten the name of the person, but somebody had written it in 1961 and intended to present it to the Modern Languages Association. So it, yes. it, it, it looked like a serious scholar's attempt to define the canon of science fiction. And it, it's not a bad list, I have to say, and it's presented chronologically. But the curious thing is that it's in reverse chronological order. And the list starts with a load of things written in the 1950s, because the list was written in 61. And so it, it starts with the most recent big quality books, you know. And if you look at those books from the 50s, there are some that we now consider classics. I think Fahrenheit 451 is in there, for instance. But there are also some that you look at and you think, why on earth is that in there? Or I've never even heard of that one. So surely the canon, unless it is kind of sealed in amber, <laughs> surely it's got to be updated and it's got to be reappraised over time. And things that are of interest to us now might be totally irrelevant to us in 10 years' time. Ultimately, is there really any point in trying to define a canon? And I, and I think that's really what Sean Duke is now looking at, according to his blog. He's become so fascinated by this idea that there isn't a science fiction canon and can't be one. I think he's going to create one. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like he's become, or may, might be leading, part of an effort to create such a canon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I liked the, the comment you said about, if we have a canon, it cannot be set in stone. Yeah. Uh, in the original article, he mentions that uh, Melville was not considered part of canon. Yes. Until someone wrote a biography of him on the anniversary of his 100th birthday. Yeah. And then a series of discussions happened over 30 years. Mm-hmm. And then starting in the 1950s, everybody reads Moby Dick in American <laughs> English Lit class. Yeah. And so I think it'll be something that you know, can change over time. You know, we'll have different values, different levels of importance. Uh, it's sometimes easier to look at things in the past than look at it in the now. Mm -hmm. There was something that he, he said in that first article. I, I can't remember the, the way he phrased it, but it was suggesting that Putting together a list of books for their historical significance was somehow not forming canon. You know, that really f forming a canon is t to identify works of quality that are worthy of study. But if you're compiling a list of influential works, that's a different thing, you know, because you could have a work which was highly influential, but is actually of very poor quality. Yeah. Um, so I think he's making a distinction between the two types of list. And, and again, that's one of the areas where I have a problem, and it's probably just me, but I'm, I'm fascinated with how things got to be the way they are. So I, I love historical lists. I, I love to see what the influences were, even if those influences were substandard in their own time or by our own standards today. They're, they're still a historical importance. True. I mean, if you... If you asked a whole bunch of science fiction authors who had influenced them, you probably would not get uh, Kazuo Ishigura. Yeah, that's a good And point. yet, uh, the novel he wrote, Never Let Me Go, about uh, British cloning for organ donation, 
which was made into a movie with Andrew Garfield and Kira Knightley. It was wonderful literature. It was an absolutely horrible story. I, I would hate to find out that my life's meaning was to be someone else's source of organs. <laughs> um, and that I was essentially meaningless aside from that. But you know, that, that's a more existential thing we should not go into. But yeah. uh, because it is literature and because you know, science fiction in general has this, this stigma of it because of its history from the pulps, a lot of authors that write science fiction-y literature prefer not to be called science fiction. Yeah. yeah. And so, would it belong in the canon, but not belong in the historical list of the most influential books? There, you've opened up another can of worms. Science fiction <laughs> is a genre. It deals in tropes and re recycling of ideas. But then there's literature, and literature has a different agenda to a genre. Genres are looked down upon. And so, the mere idea of having a canon for something which is considered to be unworthy <laughs> is really challenging. Are you saying it would be like having a list of great restaurants and having a hamburger restaurant on there? I guess it would. Yes, it would. <laughs> now, if I made my own personal list, there would certainly be a hamburger restaurant on there. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, yeah again, and you might have your favorite greasy spoon hamburger. <laughs> yeah. You might have your most like uh, esoteric culinary hamburger. That's it. A gourmet burger. Yeah. They would differ in price by like a factor of three. <laughs> At least. <laughs> where if you went downtown to a brew pub and had an elk burger with uh, bacon jelly and sautéed onions on it, it would cost you 18 bucks. <laughs> and if you went up the road to Helvetia Tavern and got the uh, Helvetia burger, it would run you six fifty with fries. Wow. I'm getting a very good insight into your world here, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I eat too many hamburgers. I also know a lot about pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there is a canon of hamburgers. No, let's not go into that. <laughs> no. no. Um, to go back to the, the idea of these lists that we all love, I suppose they are subjective. There's no two ways about it. If you compile a list, it's your list. If I compile a list, it's mine. If we collaborate on a list, it's yours and mine, but nobody else's. And I think that's one of the problems with these lists is that people will publish them and they will call them things like the best 50 science fiction books of all time. That was the Esquire one. And of course, that's making a claim. That's making an objective claim. Maybe which, it should have been titled my favorite. Well, that's the thing. Should it be called favorite books or recommended books? There's a book I've got somewhere. I can't find it at the moment, but I've got a book from the 80s written by David Pringle, which is called Science Fiction 100 Best Novels. And it's not the 100 best novels. It's a, it's a minor difference, a semantic change of just one word. But essentially, it's leaving it open to say that, no, there might be another 100 best science fiction novels and another 100. But he's just giving you 100 of them. So it, it's implying this is a selection rather than an attempt to be definitive. Um, so I think the problem with lists often is just what they're called rather than what they do. But that Esquire one, which I mentioned last time, in common with some other lists, had some constraints deliberately placed upon it, one of which was that an author can only appear once in the list. So in other words, if Asimov is going to be in there, they will only list one Asimov book. Now that, in a way, that's going to distort the, the list because some authors maybe should be represented multiple times because they've they've been so influential or their works are so important mm -hmm. but by imposing that limitation it's kind of forcing them to make decisions about what goes in and what doesn't go in and it also reserves some space in there for other authors who might otherwise be kicked out and i think if there was any criticism of the Esquire list, apart from people saying, oh, I wouldn't have put that there, I would have done this differently. <laughs> apart from yes. that, the only criticism I saw was from people who didn't like unfamiliar works being included in the list. And, of course, for the most part, those unfamiliar works were not the so-called classics. They were perhaps from authors who have not been so commercially successful but deserve to be read. Authors maybe who are not from um, the North American tradition, but from elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, 
Um, so again, the, most of the criticism was based on personal preference or snobbishness. And all of that drives me mad. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should write my own list and then everyone can disagree with me. And I've said before that um, I personally am fascinated by the historical dimension. So I really like it when people take significance and influence into account when drawing up their lists. And I think Esquire did that to an extent, but they they only did it for some of the books that were in there. So I think I think Asimov's The Complete Robot was in there. And they put it much higher in the list than I would, personally. Mm -hmm. So clearly they're putting it in there because they think it is of significance, but I think they were overrating what it actually is as a work of creative writing. The more I think about it, there's there's so many different axes that we can plot these things on. We can plot them on an axis of significance versus insignificance, mm -hmm. an axis of quality of writing versus absence of quality of writing, influence, popularity, and and then a kind of a sense of wanting to be representative and showing that you've cast your net widely in terms of considering what to, to put in. So there's so many dimensions there. You'll never get two people to agree, I don't think. Well, and even when there are objective ways of measuring something, people will disagree. Mm. So there is a... Uh, I, I play disc golf. I, I love playing disc golf. It's a lot of fun for me. Mm. There's a, an app on my phone called UDisc, which people use for keeping scores. And so UDisc has a list of courses you can play at, and... And also a way to rate each course. You know, I think this is a three. I think this is a five. Okay. Uh, those ratings are completely objective or completely subjective to each person. And UDisc, four years ago, started making lists of the most popular, most popular courses. And then they came out with a list that was the controversial one, which was the best courses. And people got in the disc golf community got all up in arms saying, how can you say this is better than that? And so you disc published an article said, well, how can we consider this is better than that? Well, one, we're the largest disc golf scorekeeping app in the world. So we have a lot of data. <laughs> Our answers are based on individual people's rankings. And so if everyone says this is a five, because we haven't visited every course, we, we trusted you. And so if you folks are ranking courses better than they should be, we have no way of knowing other than what you tell us. Mm, yeah. um, and then the people that don't use UDisc were like, well, what about these courses here that you don't know about? <sighs> yeah. Even with an objective source of data, there yeah. are still arguments. Yeah. Um, I think that's why it's important that the canon happen in a conversation between a group of people to try and bring in as many aspects and perspectives and to have you know great conversations and great theses and great papers written about it and it will evolve and change over time and that in itself will become its own study you know how has the sci-fi canon changed since the 2200s we'll find out this should be some kind of dialogue that that's what what i think is the value if there is a value the value of lists like the esquire list is that it gets people talking i think we we may be agreed on this that if it's a if it creates dialogue and discussion then it's a good thing. But I still think that that's probably the opposite of what canon is supposed to be. Canon is supposed to be sort of setting things in stone. And that seems antithetical to the idea of dialogue. Well, and then the other thing is, it depends on the kind of dialogue that's had. Yeah. You know, if, if, if I can't respect your list, even if it's not my own, if I can't learn from your list or if you can't learn from my list, mm. there's something wrong with the conversation. Yeah. Then it gets into to gatekeeping and ad hominem attacks and all kinds of bad things, which always happen on the internet. Yeah. It's, it's almost as if it was made for that, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um. But uh, so you are an academic and you've admitted right you're not an, an english lit major but mm. you have a, a pretty wide and and deep knowledge of science fiction if mm. someone were to approach you about talking about bradbury you'd be into that wouldn't you sure absolutely and if people w asked me for recommendations or if they said to me what are the 10 best science fiction novels or the 10 best books set in space or anything like that 
I'd very happily sit down and work out a list, but I think what I would probably do first of all is find out what they're interested in. And I did oh, have a, I did have somebody yeah. once uh, ask me uh, whether Fahrenheit four five one would be a good book to read. And this was just sort of out of the blue from somebody who I didn't think had any interest in in science fiction. They just said, "Is would Fahrenheit four five one be a good book to read?" And my instinctive response is say, of course, of course. But I, I I always sort of stop myself and say, well, tell me what you're interested in. What what sort of things do you like to read? Because there's no point in recommending something to somebody if it goes completely in the opposite direction to what they like. So, you know, if somebody says, oh, I like straightforward prose, then no way am I going to recommend Bradbury to them because he's a bit fancy at times um on the other hand if they say oh i love poetic turns of phrase and and that sort of thing then yes of course i'd recommend bradbury to them if they're into technical things i might recommend clark or andy weir but if they're a technophobe no way would i recommend anything like that so again it there's a dialogue involved even in in that kind of thing yeah maybe if we thought more about the canon because like you said Someone that does not like fish would never enjoy going to a fish restaurant. Mm. Um, and you wouldn't tell them, oh, well, because you don't eat fish, you really can't enjoy food. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Canon needs to be more broad or have multiple dimensions. I liked how you talked about there's the the historical context, there's the, the influential, yeah. and there's the popular. Yeah, so many dimensions. And of course, as soon as you get beyond three dimensions, we are unable to visualize because we we live in three dimensional space. Well, yeah, that's why physics so is, that's why physics is so hard <laughs> because it <laughs> it too quickly gets into multiple dimensions and we can't picture it anymore. My my reading has been suffering lately because there's a puzzle contest going on online. Mm. There's a puzzle per day every weekday. There was a puzzle earlier this week that was a, a word association game on a series of pentagons. And they don't tell you how to solve the puzzle. You have to figure it out based on the context and the clues in the puzzle itself. And yeah. I started trying to associate the words on the different points. And it's like, well, how do you how do you tile pentagons? Because mm-hmm. you can only really put them together side to side. And because of the angles, they don't. Uh, there's always gaps. But if you fold it into three dimensions, uh-huh. pentagons yeah. tessellate into a dodecahedron which oh, is a 12-sided die. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out that if you do that, all the points end up aligning the correct way. And the, so the solution of the puzzle was to form this three-dimensional figure from a series of two-dimensional shapes. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I, maybe our, our canon of science fiction will be healthier, more open, more welcoming, less mm-hmm. abusive if, if we add more dimensions to it. That's it. We need to somehow fold it back around itself, in a, a, form a tesseract out of it. Is that the word? A, a, a hypercube. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I would forget the name of the famous tesseract story. Robert Heinlein? Could be. Uh, Someone builds a, a three-dimensional interpretation yeah. of it, a tesseract, and there's an earthquake, and it falls into the fourth dimension. Yeah. Is it called something like, he built a crooked house? That could be it. Well, I think we've we've had a, a good discussion on canon there. I'll, I'll put a link to the original article by Sean Duke onto our webpage at 101sf.blogspot.com. Uh, but Sean Duke has more or less said that this has opened up a can of worms for him, and he's he's against his better judgment. He's started accumulating books and articles about canon. Uh, so I think it's turning into something of a research project for him. So what's in the article, I think, is an opening gambit, and there may be more to follow. Would you like a quiz? I would love a quiz. <laughs> now, this might be a bit of a challenge for you because it's quite early in the morning. But uh, uh, In case listeners don't know, Colin is on the west coast of the US. I'm in the UK. And we record usually around about 4 p.m. UK time, which is 8 a.m. Colin's time. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) I I have the benefit of having been awake for many hours when I I do these quizzes. So 
What I've got here is a quiz, a found quiz. This is from a website called TriviaWell.com. Now, I might skip some of the questions because although it says sci-fi, some of them are clearly not sci-fi. So, for example, the first question is about Lord of the Rings. So we'll see how you do on these. So the first question, what is the name of Ripley's cat in Alien? I don't know. No, and nor did I until I saw the answer. And then, ah, of course. Shall I tell you? Uh, I'm going to guess it's the name of a famous science fiction author. Um, not really. Not okay. really. Um, it's Jonesy. Jonesy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there must be a famous science fiction writer with the surname Jones, but I can't think of one. I think there's somebody called D.F. Jones who probably wrote Colossus, the basis of Colossus, the Forbin project. Well, and there's Diana Wynne Jones. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you consider the hunt for Red October science fiction, Jonesy yeah. was the uh, sonar phone operator. Oh, my God, that's obscure. <laughs> so let's move on to the second question. This one might be a bit easier. What is the name of the computer in 2001, A Space Odyssey? Hal. <laughs> See, that's much easier. That should have been question one, really, shouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> in which 2001 movie did Tim Roth play the character General Thade? General Thade, 2001. Yeah. And Thade Tim is spelled T H A D E. Thade. Boy, the only. Tim Roth science fiction movie I can think of is The Incredible Hulk, but that can't be right. No. General Fade. I can give you a clue if you like. Please. This was a reimagining, otherwise known as a remake. But yes, Planet the, of the Apes. Yes, yes. If you, I don't know if you remember, but at the time... Tim Burton specifically referred to it as a reimagining, which basically meant <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to use the, the name of the earlier film, but completely ignore it and do our own thing. Remind me to talk about reimaginings after the quiz. Reimaginings, okay. Okay, the next one. In The Matrix, which character says, and I quote, Neo, no one has ever done anything like this. That would be Trinity. Correct. And that would be, uh, I think, as they're getting the guns to get ready to storm the building to get Morpheus back. Ah, yeah, probably. Yes. Have you ever seen any of the um, subsequent Matrix product? (laughs) Yes, we call those matrices. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I'd have to say that the cross product in my opinion, the cross product diminishes in value as the more dimensions get added. Mm, Definitely. Now this one, I'm not familiar with this film myself, but I'm hoping that you are. In the 2007 movie, Meet the Robinsons, how many couples refuse to adopt the orphan boy Lewis? Oh, I've only seen that once, but I have seen it. Okay. Meet the Robinsons. That's the time travel movie where he goes into the future I don't know how many people have neglected to adopt Lewis. Have a guess. It's a number. Just choose a number. 15. Higher. 27. (laughs) Higher. 64. No, 114. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) He's he's obviously very unpopular. I guess. (laughs) Who played Chief John Anderton in Minority Report? Tom Cruise. Yes, correct. And what was the the name of the ship in the original Alien movie? The Nostromo. Correct. And here's a really tough one. The 2007 movie Transformers is based on a vintage line of what? Children's toys from Hasbro. Oh, very specific. The correct answer is just toys. Oh, 
uh, I have to confess, I, I have some Transformers in a box up in the closet in the other room. Oh, wow. <laughs> of, your, of your own, you mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, the next two questions are about Transformers, but I'm going to skip those just to give a bit more variety. Okay. Um, in which 2001 movie did Michael Clark Duncan play the character Colonel Attar? Let me know if you need a clue. I need a clue. Uh, you can copy and paste an earlier answer. Oh, my. Planet of the Apes? Yes. <laughs> According to this, anyway. I guess if I get military-based questions in 2001, I'm just going to answer Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who directed the 1986 movie Aliens? With an S. Aliens. That was James Cameron. It was. I will give you a Transformers question. What are the good guys called in the 2007 movie Transformers? Uh, the Autobots. Correct. And the last one, I'm going to throw this one in because they're being very cheeky. It's not science fiction at all, this one. What is the title of the 2005 hit movie The Exorcism of... Blank. Oh, Fill in it's, the blank. It's, it's the, Emily... Yes, yes, yes. Emily Rose? Yes. Surely that's not science fiction, is it? No. But but given the presence of the, um, you know, the Transformers question and the Lord of the Rings, I think they're taking the broader speculative definition yeah. of science fiction. Yeah. Bit cheeky. You got most <laughs> of them right. So very well done on that. I think the only one that you needed a bit of prompting on... Uh, Planet of the Apes, and the number of people that Lewis was rejected by in Meet the Robinsons. And I forgot Jonesy, poor cat. Oh, yes. Yes, you did. Sorry, yes. He probably did not end up well. <laughs> but very well done. So, uh, reimaginings. Yes. Uh, have you read the H. Beam Piper book, Little Fuzzy? No, I don't think I have, but I I know of it. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure I flicked through it at some point. Because of his early demise and the way he set up his estate, all of his works are in the public domain. So you, uh, you can download okay. a copy uh, and read it in your copious spare time yeah. <laughs> when you have nothing else to read. Uh -huh. But about 10 years ago, John Scalzi wrote a reimagining of Little Fuzzy called Fuzzy Nation. Right. And uh, reimagining is definitely the word I would apply to... John Scalzi's interpretation of it versus mm -hmm. the original. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot of quintessential Scalzi in it. Lots of, you know, the, the main character is very smart, very snarky. And that's, that's pretty stereotypical of his characters. And I like that. Yeah. And, you know, it makes for, for interesting, uh, exciting, fun reading. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting to see how you could take the same, literally the same character names and core premise and spin a very different story out of it. Right. Uh, all the major beats are hit. There's the, um, the you know the discovery of an alien species. Uh, there's a legal issue that comes up from that, and then the trial that that proceeds because of it, and then uh, you know the resolution. But in between there, there's a quite a different set of paths. When he did this, was the work still in copyright at that point? Uh, no. Okay. So he, he he could more or less do what he liked, but without fear of. Uh, what's the word, infringing on the original work. Right. And also, I think importantly, due to John's character and, and his writing and his respect for science fiction, it's not a, a disrespectful take on the original at all. Mm. But it, it's definitely got a scalzy kind of spin to it. Yeah. I've seen a few things where people have done something similar, usually in, in the form of writing a sequel to, to an established work. And, and I tend not to be terribly interested in those. But if somebody is doing a uh, a, a reimagining is it's a bit like re-performing something you know like a a, a singer reinterpreting a, a familiar song but in a different arrangement to what we're used to yes michael buble covers moon dance mm, i haven't heard that one but <laughs> i can imagine it <laughs> Let's move on to past, present and future, our, our usual sort of roundup of things that have floated past our attention in the last couple of weeks. 
Um, I've got one from the past, although I could argue that this is present as well. On YouTube, there's a short film which is based on Arthur C. Clarke's short story called Nine Billion Names of God, which is a story I, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned in a previous episode, uh, probably just in passing. But it's one of Clarke's classic stories. It, it's, it's not a story that you would think would make a terribly interesting film, but this is only a short film. It, you know, it's probably only about 12 minutes long or something like that. And it covers the story really well. It, it's set in 1957, and it really has to be set in the past because it's about these technicians who go off to somewhere like Tibet and take the latest computer technology so that it can generate every possible 10 letter word out of all the 26 letters of the alphabet now that that is quite a large number but a modern computer could probably do it in about 5 seconds but when Clark wrote the story back in the 40s or the 50s, computers were considerably slower than they are today. <laughs> so in order to to make this into a film, you have to set it in the past. It just doesn't make sense otherwise. Um, so it's got a nice period look and feel to it. And I think, from what I saw in the end credits, I think it was filmed in France and in the mountains of Switzerland. So what you see as the mountains of Tibet in the film are actually in Switzerland. But it's very nice to look at. Um, but it's a really charming little film, so uh, I recommend that. It'll only take about 15 minutes of your time, and it's on YouTube, so I'll, I'll put a link to that on our blog. Cool. Do you have any past items? My reading and watching has been suffering recently due to these puzzles. Um, I am rereading Firestarter by Stephen King. Right, yeah. And that is to prepare for the release of his re-adaptation, which comes out this week to uh, Peacock and the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking forward to seeing what happens uh, to the interpretation of Firestarter uh, almost 40 years later from the original. <laughs> you know, with the progress of special effects and mm -hmm. the the, initial, the original reception of this movie versus the other movie versus yeah, the book. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be very interesting. It has... Um Stephen King being involved in this new one? I don't know. I expect okay. those articles to start coming out very soon, though. Yeah. Do you have any present news stories? It's award season again. And so the shortlists have been released for the, I want to say, the Locus, the Nebula, and the Hugos now. Last last time we talked, it was just the Hugos. We should, we should think about doing a short story review again. I think so. I think that would be a great idea. Um, I think the Nebulas probably get announced first. I think that's in a couple of weeks. I'm pretty sure okay. it's this month, uh, which, for the benefit of the listeners, is May 2022. Um, I'm, I'm very. Con I've been looking at the statistics recently, and I'm very conscious that um, people are still listening to episodes that we made a year ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we're always talking about past, present, and future, and uh, it doesn't really make any sense if you don't have a time reference in there. So. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah, I think we should do that. Speaking of awards, the Los Angeles Times uh, gives out an award called the Ray Bradbury Prize. And this year it's been awarded to the author Zen Cho for her short story collection Spirits Abroad which is quite interesting. Um, Zen Cho, I believe, is uh, Malaysian-American. And uh, I've dipped into the book. I, I got the Kindle version of the book, and I've dipped into it. I've read two stories from the collection, and the two that I randomly chose to look at both sort of dealt with, I, I suppose, witchcraft, um, and as you, uh, well, from the title of the book, it's called Spirits Abroad. It sort of deals with witchcraft and spirits and animal spirits and animals transforming into people and vice versa. So it's it, it's very much fantasy rather than science fiction. But that's not a bad thing. But it's uh, it's a very charming collection. So that's one that's worth looking out for. Zen Cho, Spirits Abroad. Do you have any future items? Our our discussion of canon, well, I guess that's that's something I'm going to do in the future. I'm going to reread Xavier Dallo's Illustrated History of Science Fiction. Mm. Uh, I, I learned a ton from it. I want to learn even more and to, to delve more deeply to cement those things that I learned about mm. uh, who did what, when, and why, and yeah. the the true scope of 
you know, fiction from the Western perspective. Mm-hmm. It's in graphic novel format. Uh, a couple of future things. Uh, I don't know if you saw this week that the next Doctor Who has been announced. So the new Doctor is uh, the actor Shuti Gatwa, who is best known for uh, the character of Eric in the Netflix series Sex Education. I mean, I'm sure he's done lots of other things as well, but that's certainly what he's best known for. He was born in Rwanda, but raised in the UK. And a lot of people in online comments have been saying, oh, he's too young, he's too young. But I looked up his age, and I think because in Sex Education he plays a character who's supposed to be about 18, Mm -hmm. but in real life he's he's 30 or 29. (laughs) So uh, he's not as young as people think he is, and he is not the youngest doctor. So uh, if you hear anyone saying that, they're wrong. Gatekeeping again, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This one's too young, this one's too this, this one's yeah, too Yeah, this one's too female, you know, it's all, it's all like that. I mean, I have to admit, I haven't kept up with Doctor Who, um, with the current Doctor, because I found the quality of the writing dropped very substantially, and I just wasn't interested in it anymore. But I will start watching it again, because, uh, not specifically because there's a new Doctor, although that intrigues me, I always like to see a new Doctor introduced. But um, actually, because Russell T. Davis is returning as the showrunner, and he, by far and away, was the best showrunner the series ever had. Now, as someone outside the industry, mm. but you know, with a, a brief understanding of how difficult it is to pick the best science fiction editor, mm. w- what would you look for in a showrunner? Because you mentioned you felt like the writing had suffered. Do you think he will fix that problem, or he'll bring another perspective to it? Or I would hope he would fix it, um, and if he does a significant part of the writing himself, then he will fix it, because he's an incredible writer. If, on the other hand, he's been brought in more as a figurehead, and he's just going to let other people do the writing while he just sort of looks over the scripts and says, yes, that's OK, maybe <laughs> the quality wouldn't improve. But I'm hoping that he's he's, he's very much a hands-on person. Um, so I'm hoping that um, it, it will improve because he's a fantastic writer, far far and away better than the current showrunner, let's say. Interesting. And have you watched the newest Star Trek series to come out on Paramount? Are you talking Strange New Worlds? Yes. Yeah, no, I haven't seen it yet. I'm hoping to catch up with that very soon. I'm still on the last couple of episodes of Picard Season 2, which mm. is awful. Oh. <laughs> you know, my wife and I... My wife is not a big science fiction fan, mm-hmm. uh, but she really enjoyed Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space yeah. Nine and Voyager. Yeah. She enjoyed the beginning parts of Picard t- Season 1 because of all the nostalgia and seeing people we hadn't seen in years and yeah. revisiting these yep. characters and worlds. But the ending just completely threw her. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm a glutton for punishment, you see. I, I watch a season <laughs> and I say, oh, that was awful. But I so wanted it to be good. I so so want Picard to be a good series that I think it can't be, can't be bad a second time. So I started watching season two. The first episode was OK, but not great. It was a bit sluggish. I think, if I remember rightly, episode two was a slight improvement. And for a, a couple of episodes, it seemed like it, w- it was doing well. And then it got to the kind of the mid-season position and uh, it, it's just really badly written. It's terribly plotted. The pace is all off. The characterization is forced. It's just, oh, I'm really disappointed in it. And I'm sure, mm. I'm sure in this second season, the ending is probably something they worked out in advance because they know that they screwed up season one. Um, the The showrunner, um, was asked in an interview, what did you learn from making season one of Picard? And he said something like, you must work out your ending before you start shooting the series, which made me realise that's why season one was so bad. They hadn't written it all before they started shooting it. It's a terrible idea. I mean, in in the old form of Star Trek, where each episode was standalone, you can do that. But if you're having a season-long story, which is what they do nowadays, 
you've got to know where you're going before you switch the cameras on. It's just oh, yeah. terrible. At least for next gen, there were no uh, overarching series plots. That didn't really start happening until Deep Space Nine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I've got one final future item here, which is an interesting announcement I saw, which is of the so-called uh, Emika Walter Dinjos Memorial Award for Disability in Speculative Fiction. And this is a, a well, as the, the name of it suggests, it's in honour of a, a writer who passed away a few years ago. And there's one which is awarded for the representation of disability in a speculative fiction context, uh, context. Mm -hmm. and that's regardless of whether the author themselves has a disability or a, any health issues or whatever. And then the second award is specifically for a disabled writer for a work of speculative fiction, regardless of the focus of it. So there's two facets to it. And I think that's quite a nice thing to do. I don't know much about uh, Walter Dinjos, but I know that he died very early. I think he was about 34 when he died. Um, and he was a runner-up in the, the Writers of the Future contest yes, um, some years back, and, and very prolific. So it's great to see this um, being announced. The announcement came from, the one that I saw anyway, was on Facebook, and it came from Ogeni Chovwe Donald Ekpeki, uh, I think we mentioned last time. He's nominated for a Nebula uh, mm -hmm. this year. Uh, it's good to see that he's putting his support behind it. So it'll be interesting to see what the, the outcome of that is. And again, it's a further illustration of what we've talked about before, this kind of diversification of modern science fiction, that we're seeing a much greater representation um, of, of authors of all types from all over the world, all kinds of social backgrounds, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds, all kinds of disability and health statuses, you know. So I think that's it's really welcome news to see an award or a set of awards like that. Definitely. Do you have any more news, Colin, or any further items, or shall we wrap up? Let's wrap up. Let's wrap up. That's what the listeners have been saying uh, for the last <laughs> hour. I wish they'd wrap up. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening, folks, and we hope you'll join us next time. We're Phil Nichols and Colin Kusky. Our theme tune is from purpleplanet.com. Look for the show notes on our website, which is 101sf.blogspot.com, and you can also find us as Science Fiction 101 on Facebook. And finally, please, please follow us or subscribe to us on your podcast app. Maybe give us a five-star review if you possibly can. You'll find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Listen Notes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks once again, and we'll see you next time.